Hi, welcome to a lecture on arrays as systems. And in this lecture, I'm talking about antenna arrays, but not really so much about the antennas themselves, but rather about everything behind the antennas and considerations going on there. So this is an introduction to those electronics from a very high level, and just to introduce you to some ideas that uh, are important in the architecting of systems consisting of antenna arrays, such as phased array systems. So to begin, let's consider a typical single antenna transmitter architecture. So this could just be a radio, a radio that is just transmitting. Now there are a wide variety of architectures for accomplishing this, but a very common one, and one we'll use as an example uh, in this lecture, consists of digital signal processing, wherein the signal is generated and the modulation is done and all the signal processing is, uh, is accomplished, followed by a digital-to-analog converter. And a digital-to-analog converter does what it says, right? But an input to this digital-to-analog converter is a clock, and that clock determines the rate of samples that emerge from the D to A. Next, there is an anti-aliasing filter. The purpose of the anti-aliasing filter is to eliminate the aliases. And uh, it's not really critical to know anything about this operation in this lecture. I'm simply identifying components that you see in a typical transmitter. So we can use those components and then start to see what's going on in the overall architecture. So, digital analog conversion, alias rejection. This thing is frequency conversion. So that X uh, with a circle around it is meant to represent uh, multiplication and multiplication with a local oscillator signal. That's what LO means, a local oscillator. So multiplying a real valued signal with another real valued signal gives you a signal at the sum and difference frequencies. You eliminate the one you don't want, typically the lower frequency one, and you end up with a higher frequency signal. Why is this all desired? Well, because typically D to A's do not work as well at higher frequencies or higher sample rates as they do at lower sample rates. So it's quite common these days to generate the signal at uh, a low sample rate and then upconvert it, as we say, upconvert to a higher frequency using a mixer and uh, a uh, filter as shown here. And then finally, this operation typically does not produce enough power, so we add a power amplifier. And the the purpose of a power amplifier is to create a version of the signal at a power level which is suitable for transmission. The thing to know here is that a very common chain of components for a transmitter is DSP, digital analog conversion, anti-alias rejection, frequency conversion, typically frequency upconversion, filtering to reject mixing products, and uh, power. A simple modification for monochromatic single beam operation is shown here. We take this chunk here that we just described and we map it down here, so the same components doing the same things here. And then to implement the beamforming operation, we split that signal. Its signal splitter exists right there. And then we have to apply phase shifts, assuming we're doing something uh, of the phase shifting variety. And uh, these things are the phase shifters. They're also shown as multipliers because phase shifting can be interpreted as multiplication by e to the j psi. A phase shift of psi degrees is equal to multiplying by e to the j psi uh, radians. Uh, here are those multipliers. Uh, they're also sometimes referred to as vector modulators. That's another term for a device which does this operation, although a vector modulator can also change uh, magnitudes. Nevertheless, the idea is we implement the phase shifts using either phase shifters of some kind or vector modulators of some kind. From there, then we apply the uh, additional power that we need for transmit, and that goes off to the array, and that gives us a beam. You might ask why the power amplifiers are being shown here. Well, that's because the vector modulators may not be tolerant of the additional higher power. And also, there's often an advantage in dividing the total power output of a system across several power amplifiers. So, for those two reasons, this is often uh, the case. It's relatively rare to have a power amplifier followed by the phase shifters. Now, what happens if you want to add a second beam? 
Well, if you want a second beam, you could do the following thing. You could reproduce the transmitter uh, components, as I've shown here and highlighted here. You could implement a divider and have the multipliers implemented here, the phase shifters or vector modulators, implementing different phases that correspond to a different beam. And then you could add those things together before the power amplifier antenna combinations. So in that scheme, what you get is one beam corresponding to the component shown in black, and then you can have a second beam corresponding to the components shown in blue. Now that gives you two beams, and they're independently steerable to the extent that these phase shifters can uh, accommodate different values. All right, so that's how you would accommodate a second beam in this architecture. Now, the issue becomes that the RF plumbing, as I say, all these interconnects is what I refer to as the plumbing, becomes intractable for more than a few beams. So you can imagine doing this to implement two beams, and maybe three beams, and maybe a handful of beams, but by the time you get up to many beams, this becomes intractable because there's just too many RF connections here to manage. Each one of those RF connections is going to require some amount of uh, space, uh, either in discrete components or in, uh, uh, on a chip, and uh, you just start to run into problems with analog connections piling up on top of analog connections. In that case, a digital architecture can help. So here is the uh, digital architecture that implements two beams. And the idea here is that we do the DSP first, the digital signal processing first, and we implement the beams in digital signal processing. So all the modulation and uh, signal processing associated with modulation has occurred. Then we do the fan out, the dividing, implement the vector modulators or the phase shifters, and we do that all digitally. And for the second beam, we do the same thing. And since this is digital, this can be made very, very, very small. This could be implemented in a tiny fraction of the space available in an FPGA or in an ASIC or some other digital device. And furthermore, we can do this many times. So we can imagine having hundreds of beams implemented in such a way. We combine them digitally. Again, that doesn't take up much space compared to the analog version of the same operation. And now we have the N elements. Element 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 element system. From that point, then we implement the D to A converter, the anti-alias filtering, the up conversion, the filtering, and so on. But the idea here is that we only have to do each of these N times. We only need one of these signal chains for each of the N elements, not one of these for each of the beams. So when the number of beams is greater than the number of elements, then this certainly becomes a smart way to do it. And it might be necessary, given the difficulty in implementing the interconnects in the analog domain and the relative simplicity of doing that in the digital domain. So this helps a lot, especially for large arrays with lots of beams. But still, we have an issue. And the issue is that for each antenna, we have to have a clock for the D to A. And we have to have a local oscillator signal for the frequency up converter, which means that for the whole array, we need N clocks and N LOs. Now you might say, look, those clocks and those LOs should be operating at the same frequency for each of the elements. That may be true, but then you still need to distribute those signals and you run into the RF plumbing problem again. The plumbing problem being that the interconnects become too complicated, there's too many of them, and so on. And then you say, well, maybe I, I can avoid the interconnects by simply generating different LOs. I could have an LO here, an LO here. I could implement the synthesizers at each one of those locations. And that's sometimes done, but remember, each one of these LOs must be coherent. In other words, it's not enough for them to be generally about the same frequency. They have to be exactly the same frequency, and the phase relationships between all those LOs have to be the same. So there is uh, only bad answers here, right? One is you have a separate synthesizer for each antenna, in which case it gets expensive and power hungry. Or you have one synthesizer for the LO and you distribute it, in which case you have the RF plumbing problem. 
So much of what large array engineers do involves coming up with solutions to this combination of problems that you face, especially with large arrays. Well, that was the transmit side. What about the receive side? Well, again, we can start with the receiver architecture. This is simply an example of a receiver architecture. There are many ways that receivers get implemented. I'm just showing a representative example, and to be honest, a relatively common one. So for a single antenna radio doing receive, you might have an antenna, an LNA. LNA stands for low noise amplifier. That's typically a very low noise figure amplifier that sets the overall sensitivity of the receiver. A topic for a different lecture. A bandpass filter, which is there to provide pre-selection to eliminate strong signals that uh, are not of interest. You have another one of these frequency converters, but in this case it's a down converter. You have an anti-aliasing filter because the next stage is a digitizer, an A to D converter. So somewhat um, symmetric to the transmit architecture. Just as in the transmit architecture, you have an LO and a clock. The LO being the thing that determines the frequency down conversion, and the clock being the thing that determines the sample rate at the A to D. And then on to DSP. So, the simple modification of this for monochromatic single beam operation is shown here. We have an antenna, an antenna, 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 four antennas, four LNAs, and we need the LNAs there because we really want the sensitivity of this whole system to be limited by the LNAs because they have the lowest noise figure of anything in the system. So typically we want to keep those close to the antenna. And so we put them to the left. Then we have the phase shifters or vector modulators, depending on what we're implementing here. Instead of a splitter, of course, we have a combiner, right? So at that point we formed our beam and then on to the receive architecture that I showed above. And if we want a second beam, then the idea is we'd pick off these signals right after the LNA outputs, run them through another set of phase shifters or vector modulators, add them together to get that second beam, and then on to a second parallel receiver chain. So completely analogous to the transmit operation I showed previously. Now, can we do a third beam and a fourth beam? Sure. The problem is the RF plumbing becomes intractable for more than a few beams. All the same issues I described before for transmit appear here for receive. Once again, digital architecture can help. It gives us some way to manage this, but not without new problems. So let me show you typical receive architecture. Antenna, 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 antenna. LNA, 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 LNA. Again, typically we want those LNAs close to the antennas. Bandpass filters frequency down converters, anti-aliasing filters, A to Ds, that is digitizers. And then what we do is we distribute in the digital domain those element signals and do the beam forming. So now we've moved all the plumbing that's complicated, all the plumbing associated with the array processing into the digital domain where it's easier to manage. And so we can take each digitizer output and send it to each of the beams. And we can do this for literally hundreds of beams in modern technology. These phase shifters are just multipliers and uh, combiners can be implemented as adders and so on. So as before, this helps a lot. Still, you have the problem that you have a number of clocks equal to the number of elements and a number of LOs that have to be synthesized equal to the number of elements. And the dist distribution of these can be challenging and if you choose to avoid the distribution problem by synthesizing each one of those for each element independently, then you have the problem that they have to be coherent. So this is where we land on the receive architecture. So you might now ask the question, what if you want to transmit and receive? After all, there's relatively few applications where you do only one or the other. In most applications, including communications applications, and radar applications, you have to transmit and receive, and often it's required to do it through the same array. So if you're required to transmit and receive through the same antenna elements, you have to find some way to manage that dichotomy, the transmit-receive difference. So here are some options. 
One is you can go half duplex. Half duplex means one direction at a time. So in such a scheme, what you do is you have the antenna, and then you have a switch, and the switch chooses whether the antenna is hooked up to the transmit electronics or to the receive electronics. You have to pick one or the other. So the antenna array can only be used for transmit or for receive, but it can be either one uh, via the switch. The other general class of options is full duplex. In full duplex, you have the ability to transmit, that is send a signal, in this direction at the same time as you're receiving. That requires a device known as a duplexer. A duplexer is a RF component, an RF device, which allows that flow of uh, signal energy in both directions. The problem is, of course, that you do not want energy to go directly from the transmitter to the receiver. You want energy to go from the transmitter to the antenna and away, or you want energy to come from the antenna and go to the receiver. Power which goes directly from the transmitter to the receiver is dangerous because typically the transmit power levels are gigantic compared to what the receiver is expecting. And that could damage the receiver. It could certainly desensitize the receiver. So the challenge in duplexer design is to implement a device which can simultaneously handle those signals with high isolation, that is, a good ability to keep the transmit power out of the receive path. And that can be very, very difficult. So this is a tough choice between these two. In many applications, you'd like full duplex. Uh, you have to settle for half duplex. In some systems, this determines the protocol and higher levels of the protocol stack design because you might be forced to be half duplex. And to be clear, many communication systems are half duplex. That's not quite the limitation you might think it is because typically that switching can happen very fast uh, on the order of milliseconds. Yet another issue is that this must be repeated for each antenna. It's not enough to do this once, but every antenna has to do the switching back and forth. And immediately you see that we face the plumbing problem again, that we have a lot of interconnects to deal with. So it should be clear to you that antenna array engineers or folks who are designing and implementing array systems spend a lot of time kind of wringing their hands about how to do these interconnects, and they can really drive the design of a system. By the way, combinations of switches and duplexers, combined with power amplifiers for transmitters and LNAs for receivers, are known as TR modules. This term comes up a lot in array system engineering. A TR module is simply that chunk of a system which is doing either switching or duplexing and typically contains uh, the power amplifiers and the LNAs as well. So TR module design is often partitioned off as a separate problem because all these components have to interact with each other. They have to play well with each other in the ways that I just pointed out. One other thing I would like to talk about in this lecture is subarray processing. The idea is that sometimes you need N antennas. Maybe you need a thousand antennas according to some application. But maybe you can only afford K signal chains, and K is much less than N. So maybe you need a thousand antennas, but for whatever reason, you can only manage to implement 10 signal chains, which means that unless you do something clever, you're going to end up only being able to use 10 antennas of the thousand that you have to implement. Or it might be that maybe you can only handle M, which is N divided by K, antennas at a time. So the answer to these kinds of problems is typically subarray processing. In subarray processing, you take those n elements, maybe a thousand or so, and you handle them in stages. In the first stage, you handle only sets of m antennas at a time. So if n is a thousand, maybe you do ten here, ten here, ten here, and then in the second round of processing process it as if it was a K element array. This is sometimes also known as hierarchical processing, referring to a hierarchy, so that the uh, architectures I showed previously, like these, are said to be hierarchically flat because they deal with all N antennas at once. And then architectures that do this uh, are said to be hierarchical, not flat, but having multiple stages of processing. 
This scheme has a dramatic benefit in terms of mitigating interconnect problems and some other problems that emerge in array engineering. And it, of course, has the downside that dealing with 10 elements at a time and then those beam formed outputs uh, separately reduces the flexibility you have. So this is not a free lunch. There are, in fact, uh, several limitations of this, which uh, are addressed in separate lectures. Finally, let's address some additional practical issues that emerge in array systems engineering. One of them is that array system cost tends to scale as the number of elements. And what I mean by that is, if you figure out how much it costs to implement one element, and you have a thousand elements in the array, the array can't help but to cost on the order of a thousand times more. So this can be quite a serious limitation. And a lot of what array systems engineers do ends up being trying to beat this trend. So if you can figure out a way to implement a system in which the uh, array system cost scales as the square root of n, that becomes very interesting. This uh, issue here is something that, again, array systems engineers, people who deal with large arrays, spend a lot of time thinking about. How to get the system cost to be a low uh, power of n, the number of elements. Second issue, mutual coupling, electromagnetic coupling between antenna elements. Oftentimes, you can neglect the mutual coupling. You generally should not assume that mutual coupling is, is something you neglect. In many other systems, it is part of the design, and it's one of the things that makes the system perform well. Calibration. If you implement all this plumbing, there's a thousand reasons why the phase shifts that you intend to implement will be different from the ones that actually end up in the hardware. So you typically have to do something like calibration, which means some kind of process in which you determine all these unknown internal phase and magnitude uncertainties. And it in, unto itself can be an entire subsystem that has to be implemented with all the associated costs and, uh, and uh, effort. And by the way, these calibrations can be static or dynamic. You hope for static because then you only have to calibrate once and you can assume that it uh, does not change. But frequently, calibrations change because the system heats up or because there is some kind of relative movement, in which case you have to dynamically and perhaps continuously calibrate. Again, a whole set of issues associated with that. Yet another thing to consider is a radome. A radome is a protective, a typically aerodynamic covering over the array. And that's to protect the array elements and uh, perhaps the electronics from uh, the weather. That radome is uh, a whole set of issues unto itself because it has to be transparent to the array and yet provide this mechanical protection. And then finally, and certainly not least important, the issues of power consumption and thermal management are huge issues with array system engineering. And the reason is because you have so many antennas with so many associated signal chains that you can't help but to end up with a lot of power consumption a lot of current required to operate the system. And whenever you have a lot of current and electronics which are not 100% efficient, then you inevitably generate heat. You end up with a system which is power hungry to start off with, and then because it's consuming so much current, you have a thermal issue. And the thermal issues dictate a lot of other things like spacing between signal chains. You'd really like to pack everything into a tight little space, but perhaps each one of these signal chains is producing so much heat that the aggregated heat dissipation is too much for the system to handle, in which case you have to spread things out or come up with a clever cooling scheme. So these are hand-in-hand -hand issues, and they have a surprisingly uh, large impact on system design because they limit how closely you can put things, especially the key electronics like the digitizers, D to A converters, and the power amplifiers. That concludes this brief introduction to uh, array system engineering, arrays as systems.